Hey, good morning, guys. <clears throat> I hope you guys are having a good day. My name is Dr. Boyce Watkins, and welcome to the Black Financial Channel. This is the theblackfinancialchannel.com, and uh, today I want to talk a little bit about what's going on in the stock market. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things happening uh, this week, and I thought that I would kind of brief you on some of the things that I'm seeing and some of the things that uh, you may want to be aware of. Uh, so anyway, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning on Instagram. Uh, Mr. Aaron Sale, I see you. I see you. And uh, today I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the research I've been doing in terms of what's been going on with markets and uh, and a lot of manipulation. Yeah, uh, I think that's a good term to use. Uh, you know, it's um, it's kind of interesting. And so uh, basically you, you have um, a crazy head fake that happened last week. I did a video the other day called the Omicron head fake, and it was basically driven by the fact that um, if you, you know, and I've, I've mentioned this before, so I'm, I'm going to be brief on that. But, uh, you know, if you go back last week when the market started going crazy and plummeting and everything else, I was trying to figure out why. Remember that when the stock market reacts in a strong fashion like that, there's always a reason why. There's always a reason why. So you have to sort of, you know, figure out what what's going on. Right. And then you make an assessment. OK, is this. Uh, you know, is this uh, a common cold or is it the flu? You know, are we are we going to be sick temporarily or are, are we going to be sick permanently? And uh, and I, I remember just kind of saying, God, you know, I really don't feel like this 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 uh, setback is a big deal. I, I can't find anything about the media reports and and, you know, what the doctors are saying about this variant that leads me to think that there's a reason for the market to drop this much. Right. And, and, and what you now what you want to do is you don't want to overestimate how smart you are, though, either. You know, what's going on, El Haji and Renita? I see you. Uh, shout out what city you're from, by the way. Feel free to shout out your city. And if I if I take a little break or something, I, I'll shout you back. Um, but, yeah, so so you don't want to you don't you one of the things you want to learn. You know, you, you guys know my background. right? I have a lot of education. I went to school. Literally, I was in school from age 18 to age 31. And then I wasn't even I didn't really learn. I learned finance at a much, much higher level once I finished my PhD. So uh, so one of the things you learn is when you have a lot of education, you should never take yourself too seriously. You know, you never want to be the dummy who thinks they're smarter than they actually are. And what I've noticed about life is that typically it's the it's the dumbest person in the room who thinks they're the smartest person in the room. Uh, if you're really smart, you'll you'll never overestimate how smart you are. Right. You'll back up and kind of say, OK, what am I missing here? Maybe there's something going on I, I don't see. Right. And so that's how that's what I kept sort of doing. I told you guys what my honest assessment was. And I said, I don't think the market's going to keep dropping. I cannot imagine this being a prolonged decline because there was nothing happening in the stock market that justified that kind of decline. But I was looking for information. I was looking for them to explain to me why the market was supposed to drop like that. <clears throat> why it made sense to cut off all incoming flights to, you know, from from South Africa. Why it made sense to literally behave as if the pandemic was starting all over again. And uh, in hindsight, you know, uh, we know what happened, right? It turns out that the variant is, it's a variant. It's out there. It's, you know, the, the virus is real, but it ain't going to come out here and kill everybody. Uh, you know, there, there's plenty of stuff out here to sort of protect yourself. We're actually much better at fighting it than we are were before, right? It's gone beyond just jabs. Now they got jabs and pills and st stuff you can take, you know, home tests you can get, you, know, you can take at home and, and pills you can take if you catch it. And and so, you know, basically, uh, if you held, held tight, like we talked about, you're probably happy about that because right now the market is doing extremely well. It made up everything and then, and then some. Also, if you were really feeling bad about it, you went and you bought. <laughs> you went and you bought some stock, right? I, that's what I did. I, I I saw some companies in there that were at bargain basement prices. I had some extra cash. I said, let me just dive in and head first and see what see what I can see. Um, and uh, and so it's been really good. That this is right now a pretty good week. But really, the thing you want to understand when it comes to investing is you don't you want to think beyond this week. You want to always be thinking like five years, ten years down the line. Because I remember, you know, remember I showed you guys. Uh, those of you that are in the stock market class, we were talking the other day about how, you know, if you there, there are easy moves, easy, predictable moves, predictable, not not just simple, but simple and predictable where, where five years ago, I could have told you these are good. There are easy, simple, predictable moves you could have made five years ago that will put you in the sweet spot right now. 
like I, for example, we talked about Bitcoin. I was like, yeah, Bitcoin's at what 47, 48,000. It's dropped from 60,000, which seems bad, but really it's way up from what it was a year ago. And I, I look back and I say, oh my God, five years ago, Bitcoin was a thousand bucks. So imagine if you were a person who simply had patience, who said, let me, let me get, let me get 10 of these Bitcoins. I got, I got 10 grand saved up or maybe five grand, three grand, whatever your number is. Right. And I'm just going to buy me 10 of these Bitcoins to just throw, you know, just throw them on my online somewhere and think about it. I'll think about it five years from now. You would have killed the game, right? 10 Bitcoins now is worth $580,000. Is that right? About $600,000, right? So that would have been a $10,000 investment that grew, grew, grew to $600,000. Uh, that's an easy move. You know, it's a hard move if you're trying to do it short term. It's a hard move if you're trying to make your money tomorrow. It's a hard move if you're trying to make your money in a week or, or a month. It's an easy move if you're trying to make your money in five years. That's why I rock with uh, Kathy Wood. Kathy Wood runs ARK Investing. I like Kathy Wood because Kathy Wood's like, I ain't getting caught up in this quarterly crap and looking at what's going to happen this month and next year. Kathy Wood is trying to own the damn future. And that's what I'm talking about. You know, I I, I think that's <laughs> I, that that's the mindset that I I fully endorse. That's the mindset of somebody who is she's probably a billionaire already, but she's going to be a she's going to be like up there with the Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos is. By the time she's done, uh, and she's 70, so she's got she's really thinking, I guess, in terms of generational wealth. But um, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan. So anyway, do me a favor. Hit the thumbs up button. Thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up. And if you're watching on the Black Financial Channel, just so you know, uh, if you want to make a comment and you can't make a comment, just subscribe to the channel and you can make a comment. Because I, I, I'd, I'd rather have comments from subscribers as opposed to trolls who just pop in and say any old crazy thing. So that's so we we did switch over switch all the channels are going to be pretty much where you have to commit before you can comment. You have to c commit before you comment, right? So you have to make your opinion worth something by showing me that you are in it for real and you're not here to just troll. Uh, cause we ain't got time for trolls. We trying to, we trying to build the future. Uh, so I see Blackwood is from Atlanta. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Glenn Tavia says, I'm not worried because what I learned from you is to be well diversified. That's absolutely true. Uh, diversification, buy and hold and spreading your money out. Those are the two biggest rules for investing that tend to work. All right. So, uh, and by the way, so just in case, um, you're interested in Forex, we are having a Forex event in the Black Business School. Uh, if you go to boycewalkins.com and look at the top, it's it's totally free. It's going to be Friday. Courtney Logan, he's an attorney. He's a great Forex expert. He's the guy we selected. It took us two, three years to decide who we wanted to rock with on Forex. And Courtney Logan just came along and we just love what the brother had to say. He's very smart. So we um, are inviting him in. The event is free to the public. So you can join us Friday and you can see how great the Black Business School is. We are better than whatever college you went to. I guarantee you. I, I'm a college professor. I taught at Syracuse University 13 years. We designed a bigger, better, blacker version of education that um, is, is extraordinary. So feel free to take a look. Uh, go to boycewalkins.com or if you're on Instagram, the link is in the bio and you can join us on Friday night at eight o'clock. Uh, now, a couple more things that, so in terms of things that are happening right now with the market, uh, you've got uh, an issue with uh, tapering. Uh, the Fed is going to be tapering, which is basically they're going to stop uh, inflating asset prices by pumping money into the economy. Right now, the Fed is buying bonds. They're pouring cash into the economy, which is creating what is called asset inflation. Asset inflation is not good um, because it's uh, well, it's good for rich people. <clears throat> That's why or, or for investors. It's good for investors. That's why I've told you guys in, in this economy, the worst thing you want to be is a worker who doesn't invest. If you want to really if you really want to play yourself, like if you really want to play yourself and play your kids, teach them just to get up and go to work every day for a paycheck and to never think about owning assets. You know, literally, because what's going to happen is they're going to become the mule of America. Capitalism needs its mules. And it, it sucks. I mean, it's not fair, but it's life. Right. So you get to books like uh, we're reading Black Labor, White Wealth by Dr. Claude Anderson uh, in the book club. We meet for the book club every Wednesday. The link is in the bio. If you go to boycewalkins.com, you can find access to the book club. That's free also to the public. And in this book, they talk about how black wealth built all of America. That literally, you know, the reason America survived 
it's because they had access to black slaves. I'm not kidding. Like literally he breaks down and explains how uh, they, the white folks had so much free land that they were like, who's going to do all the work. <laughs> and they said, Oh, well, we can find a way to change the laws and just make black people slaves. And, and next thing you know, uh, within about 30 year period, 16, maybe 1630 to 1660, they just flipped all the laws and made black people basically do all the work. So the same way black people built America and all, you know, you know the wealth of America is on black people's backs. That's what's happening now with capitalism, where the worker who doesn't invest is the mule of America. Because what's happening is you're you're work you're working the same amount. You every you're working forty hours a week or whatever. But what's happening is everything's becoming more expensive. Inflation is always there, and so and what's getting inflated? Well, the prices of houses is going up. Stock market's going up. Uh, you know, and then what eventually happens is it spills over into food and other things, right? But are your wages going up? Give me a yes or no. Are workers' wages going up to match inflation? Are workers' wages going up? You know, they, do they say, hey, well, you know, the price of bread has gone up 30%. We're going to increase minimum wage by 30%. Do they do that? Give me a yes or no. No, they don't. They don't do that, right? So so the only protection you have against inflation is to own, an, own assets that inflate with the economy, right? You, you know, I think the number that I recently saw was 6.2%, something like that. That's crazy. That's a big number. That's a giant. That's like, what the hell, man? Your wage, your wages ain't going up 6.2%. And so, so really you gotta, you know, owning those assets is critically important. Uh, I saw someone who had the conspiracy theory that inflation was designed to benefit the rich. I could not disagree with that conspiracy theory, but I would, I would just sort of modify it slightly by saying inflation isn't designed to just benefit the rich. It's really designed to benefit investors who happen to be rich. Right. When people talk about, you know, faking it till you making it, faking it till you make it like like being rich means acting rich. Well, acting rich in a healthy way, not not Gucci and, you know, diamonds and gold. You ain't acting rich. You're acting stupid when you're doing all that silly stuff. But acting rich means acting being an investor. That means even if you don't make a lot of money, you're owning assets, you're accumulating assets and you're measuring your economic success by how many assets you have you've acquired. And then what happens is that when asset prices get inflated, your wealth gets inflated with it. You follow me? Okay. So basically, uh, the big factors uh, going on right now that people are worried about with the economy are one, tapering from the Fed. Uh, the Fed is going to slow down its support. That's going to probably cause a dip in the prices of a lot of your assets, particularly what they call your long duration assets, like meaning those little crappy little SPACs that ain't making no money yet. That are you know that are just you know highly inflated in value. They're, that that's just a speculation run. I mean they're just they're just grabbing money because everybody's buying anything and giving money away. Um, you know you also see the the um, the the froth as they call it in the inflation uh, uh, crypto space where a lot of people are issuing these crappy coins. Uh, I talked to my homeboy. His name is Bill Thomason. He's actually going. If you're in the Black Crypto Club. He's actually going to be one of our guests in the Black Crypto Club next month. Uh, this month, we're bringing in Rebecca Samuels, who's an accountant who specifically focuses on people that own crypto to make sure you don't get in trouble with the IRS with your crypto ownership. You got to make sure you, you're, you're, you're clear on that. And so Rebecca's a specialist on that. Uh, so if you want to join our Black Crypto Club that meets regularly, uh, Teddy Ewing runs that. She's our, one of our faculty members. You can uh, go to BoyceWatkins.com. The Black Crypto Club is up there. Uh, BoyceWatkins.com. That's my that's my website. And uh, also on Instagram, you can just hit the link in the bio. But anyway, one thing Bill Thomason was telling me is that, uh, you know, he was talking about how literally like 98% of the new cryptos were just garbage, like literally just garbage that they threw out. And they said, if you make it, if you make it sound good, people will buy it because everybody wants to jump in on crypto. So he created a fund. Um, I think they run, they, they, they control a few million dollars in assets. It's not a giant fund, but it's big enough. And, um, and I mean, they've been able to make a kill, you know, they, there's a, there's, so there's money there, there's treasure buried there and some of it's good long-term. But a lot of it's built on massive amounts of speculation where they're doing rug pulls on people and getting people to buy stuff. And then, you know, and then the price goes up and then they they the insiders sell and then you're left holding the bag. So don't don't let that happen to you. Uh, so anyway, uh, so some other factors. One, uh, the Fed's tapering is going to be a big deal. That's going to be a big market mover. The other one is inflation. 
Uh, inflation keeps going up uh, because the Fed is pumping money into the economy. Some people believe that the Fed's tapering or slowing down the support is driven by the fact that they, too, are worried about inflation being out of control. Right. So uh, that so inflation is a big deal. Uh, that's an issue which links to the next one, which is earning stability. Companies are having a hard time operating in this environment because prices are going up. Supply chain bottlenecks are everywhere. Uh, they don't know if they can get enough workers. They don't know if they can get enough shipping containers to ship their products. So it's kind of interesting to see how companies are navigating this. Amazon, just shout out to Amazon. It's just a smart company with smart leadership because they're they're really adapting extremely well to the supply chain bottlenecks. Like Amazon, they just, they just have this habit of taking over the game. So they're li literally buying their own shipping containers, buying their own ships, you know, like just uh, just doing all this interesting stuff that nobody else is doing. That's allowing them to skirt a lot of the bottleneck issues that that are going on. And um, and so I think Amazon, obviously, long term, you know, could be a good investment. And if it, and it with last week's dip, maybe that was a good opportunity to buy some um, Amazon. Uh, now, if you have specific questions, like I see your question, Jarvis, how do I determine the value of a stock? Well, there is a process with that. Um, we, but that's more something we would cover in class because like, there's more detailed stuff. So if you want to go take a look, uh, just go to boycewalkins.com and join my stock market class. There's a ton of curriculum in there. I break down literally everything you ever want to know about stocks. I mean, that's what my PhD is in. So uh, I can't tell you in five minutes how to value a stock. Um, it's, it's, it's really something that requires a little more thought. Uh, and so anyway, the other thoughts here in, in terms of stocks that I like uh, for next year, um, I like Walmart a lot. I think Walmart is, is a company that is going to benefit um, when the reopening occurs, when the economy finally recovers from, you know, from this dip. I, I, I really think they're well positioned to do well. Uh, but another one I've heard good things about is Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is uh, solid because they've got their multinational company that is going to benefit when uh, a lot of these emerging market economies start to do better. Right now, a lot of the economy still is pretty flat. It hasn't become what it's supposed to be. It's very volatile relative to uh, what it usually is. So as the economy starts to improve and these viruses start going away, you, you're going to start seeing more stability, which increases stock prices and allows companies to make money. And so you're going to see earnings go up also because all this stuff will kind of be behind us. Because right now, it's still not behind us. We keep getting these media scares. And the whole Micron thing, that, that whole thing with that whole variant, one thing that's interesting about that is, so the conclusion now with the scientists is that it's mild as hell. It, it wasn't worth all the panic. Um, and in fact, they actually say that it could actually do a better job than the jabs in terms of giving people immunity, right? <laughs> that literally it's something you can catch. You, you you feel bad for about three days, but then you have some natural immunity. And, uh, and I don't know why natural immunity isn't discussed as much. Um, I think people that um, that have that jump past natural immunity and jump right into getting the jab. These people have an agenda, or maybe their agenda is that they're germaphobes and weird and crazy, and you know want to force people to do what they're doing. And, and it, 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 it's, it's, it bothers me a little bit. And so, um, what was interesting was the CEO of Moderna uh, was was basically kind of saying, you know, our our existing jabs. I can't say the V word because YouTube picks up when I when I use the V word. Also, in fact, on Instagram. Um, I, I think I'm shadow banned on Instagram because I've talked about these issues. If you notice, whenever I post on Instagram, two things happen. One, there's a ton of bots. Anybody else notice that on Instagram? Whenever I talk, there's whenever I put up a post, I got to go in and delete like 50 bot posts that, that just instantly occur within five minutes. It's the craziest thing. I think that's deliberate. I think that's a strategy to block certain messages or whatever, because I don't see that happening with everybody else. Even the shade room, like you would think the shade room would have more bots than me, but they don't. Um, the second thing uh, is uh, I, my daughter, uh, she has a friend who's 14 years old, who it was real weird. The little girl was like, she's like, I heard that. She's like, I heard that you, that you're famous. And I was like, no, not really. I'm just, I just run my mouth on the internet. And she said, she said, can I follow you on Instagram? I said, yeah, sure. Okay. And she said, so, so uh, I said, well, she says, so what's your Instagram? I says, it's the real voice Watkins. And she, she, so she just hands me her phone and says, can you type it in? So I, I type it in. I'm looking for myself on her phone. I did not come up. Did y'all know that? I literally could not find my own Instagram page on her phone. Isn't that crazy? Like, so I, I typed and I was like, well, maybe if I put in Boyce Watkins, it'll come up. Nope. Uh, a lot of fake pages came up, but my main, my, my page does not come up. So I don't know. Maybe you guys can test it on, you know, or something, but it was really interesting. So I, so I think that they, they shadow ban people if they're, if you're a little too black or a little too honest, 
I'm not a terrorist. I'm not somebody that's going to go out and hurt somebody, but they're defining anyone who doesn't agree with what they say as a terrorist type person. And that's, and that bothers me because I, I, I hear hurt nobody. I, I, I'm just, you know, I think I'm pretty mild actually, but it is what it is. Uh, so, uh, but, but I will say this, uh, when I heard the CEO of Moderna talking about um, the response to the thing coming out of the variant coming out of South Africa, one of the things he mentioned that was really interesting, and this got a lot of people freaked out in the market as well, because they, um, because what happened was uh, the market was kind of recovering, and then the Moderna CEO did this interview, and then the the stock started plummeting again because he came. It sounded like he was saying, "Yeah, our existing jabs do not work against this new variant. It's not effective, right?" In an in initial test, right? And and I was like, "Well, why would the CEO of Moderna say?" that the existing jab doesn't um, work against the new variant. What would make him say that if it wasn't true? Well, the reason I, you have re, right, you know, good reason to be skeptical is because if I tell you that the jab you already got doesn't work, that lets me sell you a booster, right? I can sell you a new jab. They call that, um, they call that planned obsolescence. That is where uh, it's almost like if, if you're a rapper and you put out an album in 2021, uh, well, you 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 want that album to play out so that people will buy your new album in 2022, right? So basically, companies will do that. They'll put out a product like like the iPhone, you know, in you know one year, an iPhone 10, but then they need you to buy the iPhone 11. So they got to convince you that the iPhone 10 is obsolete. That, oh, no, you know, you're, you're a sucker if you still got the iPhone 10. The iPhone 10 ain't nothing. Like in the Wiz, remember in the Wiz when he was like telling everybody what color to dance with? He was like, the color, the color now is red. And then, and then, and then, and then they're like, and then he's like, and then he stops. He's like, stop, 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 stop. The color now is green. And everybody turns, everybody starts wearing green. And then he's like, and they're like, I wouldn't be called dead in red. Right. So literally, that's what they kind of, I think that's the game they play with you. That literally, if I tell you that the old product that you already got is obsolete, then that makes you feel like you have to get the new one. Now, I don't know if it's that sinister, but I do know it turned out that, you know, all the medical experts are now saying that it's not a big deal, that it's going to be OK. And, uh, and 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 what it does really is it reminds us one. It, this is something I, I've always felt. The lockdowns are off the table. People ain't Americans anyway, ain't going for no damn lockdown. They did just not. They're like. You could literally give them that whole pandemic all over again, like the height of the pandemic. There are some people who are just like, no, we'll just take our chance. If that if that means there's a 0.1% chance, a one in a thousand, one in 500 chance that I'm going to catch a virus and die, I'm okay with that. You know, means 500 of us go out, 499 of us live. There are people who really think that's an acceptable risk. Like, think about it. You know, when you look at old videos of the Vietnam War and World War II, You'd have, you know, a thousand soldiers that would go, you know, raid a beach and they know that 30 percent of them ain't coming back, but they would still raid the beach. Why would you go raid a beach when you know that you have a 30 percent chance of not coming back? Well, because you're like, that's what it is. Like we have a job to do. We're going to do a shout out to the soldiers, by the way. I, I admire you. I really t- tremendously so. Right. It's, it's so ultimately it's, it's kind of like in this country. I think you just have different uh, perceptions of risk. Right. There are some people who say, I will not leave my house if there is a one in 5,000 chance that something bad will happen to me. But then there's some people who like live in the hood. Like, think about it. You live in South, West Side, Chicago. You know that there's like a non negligible probability that somebody is going to die today, right? Every day. Right? Every day, South Side, Chicago, somebody dies every single day. But there's still people who get up and they live. They get up and they go to work. They get up and do what they're going to do. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I'm not saying that it's right. I'm saying there's nothing wrong with that. Right. And so ultimately, I think there are people who just accept the risk. And what I noticed is when I travel to different parts of the country out west, everybody's scared. Everybody's like, oh, my God, I can't touch you if you haven't got your shot. And I'm going to and you got to be real careful about that. There was um a guy uh, who was part of the Nazi regime who, who he, he survived it. He was Jewish. And he was saying that, that, that all that starts like with little tiny steps. He said like, so they say, Oh, well, Jewish people can't use the park bench. And then you're like, well, there's plenty of park benches. So, you know, so who cares? It's fine. I'll just sit on another one. And then they start saying, Oh, well, the Jews can't use the bathrooms. And like, okay, well, there's plenty of bathrooms. I'll just use another one. And then they just keep going and going and going until eventually you realize 
being Jewish leads to tremendous amounts of stigma that can cause other problems, right? So I think that now we got to be careful about these stigmas that people are putting out there about people who don't have the jab. Like you have people writing articles saying that somebody in your family doesn't have the jab. You shouldn't invite them to, to Thanksgiving dinner. You shouldn't, um, you know, you shouldn't socialize with a person like that. Those people are ignorant. You shouldn't be. So what you're doing is you're dehumanizing people who disagree with your point of view to the point where if somebody says, well, if you didn't get the jab, you should go to jail. You're like, yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I mean, shoot, what, what kind of idiot wouldn't get the jab? Right. And then next thing you know, they're going to prison and getting beaten up and raped and killed and stuff because you think it's okay. Cause you're like, well, those people, if they didn't want to go to jail, they would do what, what the rest of us are doing. So that's kind of, uh, you know, just a, a slippery slope to walk down. This happened throughout history and we don't know our history, which is why we're, we're, we're doomed to make the same mistake. So, um, in terms of, uh, of of the factors that matter right now in the market, in my view, I'll go through them again really quickly. Uh, Fed tapering, the Fed not supporting the economy as much as uh, as they did before. Inflation, inflation is a big deal. They're going to have a hard time controlling this. The worst case scenario is stagflation. If you have stagflation, which is uh, high inflation and a bad economy at the same time, then just know that that's a nightmare. Economically, that's going to be a problem. So the Fed is trying to avoid stagflation, which means they're going to really push on the tapering, to, which is which is designed to kind of deal with the inflationary issue before it gets out of hand. You also have uh, that, that variant issue. There's going to be a new variant. They're dropping new variants, like new albums. And I, I just, I think it's to the point where it's just, there's so many different permutations of this particular virus. And at some point, I'm really curious if there is an agenda, I'm curious if there's going to be a point where they're going to be like, oh, this is the variant that's going to kill 10 percent of the people that are infected or whatever. Then it's like a game changer at that point. Right. And uh, and and there's and I watch both sides of the aisle in terms of conversations. And I did see where Rand Paul was really pushing Fauci about uh, this gain of function research, which is a big deal. You guys may want to look into that because the gain of function research kind of says something that I believe the Chinese are sinister enough to do. I believe that they do this. I, I believe they do this around the world, which is where. They're deliberately taking viruses and making them more deadly, right? Just because germ warfare is the next frontier of warfare. And the America is at war with China, in case you didn't know it. We just, it's just not a blatant war. So, so my thought is, man, if, you know, are they going to let out like one of these really deadly viruses, which really at that point is going to make it hard for you to argue against a lockdown, right? I mean, you know, because I mean, one in 500 people is not that many people, right? You know, and I mean, but for some reason, like, you know, if somebody has a, a friend whose 85 year old grandma died, they, they suddenly somehow we think it's I could be next. But you're not 85 years old. You're not your friend's grandma. It doesn't mean, you know, it can't happen. But it's like, did, but did it happen to somebody that's right next to you, like your sibling, you know, your parent? In that case, I can understand the trauma. But typically, it's like, I know somebody who knows somebody where this happened to them, right? And 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 so it's kind of um a scary world we live in, and 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 so the shoe could oh, the shoe could drop at any time, uh, but also the earnings volatility issue for companies just operating in this uncertain environment is another factor that's really going to kind of wrinkle the stock stock market a little bit. And uh, and again, the companies that I liked the most were Walmart and Coca Cola in terms of companies you could probably buy into now that at some point they're going to get to get to getting when it comes to making money. And so if somebody did something where they were just buying a little bit of Coca-Cola every week or a little bit of Walmart every week, I don't see that as being a bad strategy. I think that would be a winning strategy. Now, if you get into all this other stuff, the Doge coins and all that, <laughs> I can't take responsibility for what happens to your money at that point. So I would encourage you to be very careful about these kind of off the radar assets that are purely speculative. Like there's nothing fundamentally solid about buying Dogecoin because you're, you're buying it because you're hoping somebody else will buy it from you for more than what you pay for it. That's pretty much all you're, you're kind of doing. And I, and, and, and a guy, you know, pitch me on a, on a coin. I always tell people when they pitch coins to me, I'm like, I'm not promoting anybody's crypto. I'm just not interested. Cause I don't, you know, I mean, and I have experts that I talk to Doc Montgomery and Teddy Ewing and, and um and and uh Jamar uh, some other, just some other people there's some other people out here that I talk to Carla Ballard I like her a lot and um and it's like a lot of times when people pitch me these new cryptos I'll I'll send it to my experts and I'll say what do y'all think you know what do you think this is something I'd, I'd want to invest in because first I'm thinking like do I want to even invest in it myself and I'm not going to tell anybody about an investment I made until I'm absolutely 100 percent sure that I feel good about the investment if I don't even feel good if I'm not sure about it. I won't even tell anybody about it because I'll be like, you know what? I'm going to take this risk myself. 
And then if it works out good, then maybe I'll talk more about it. But I don't want other people following me down a death trap if I chose to do something that I felt was openly speculative. And I'm going to tell you, every crypto that gets pitched to me, they're like, mm, I wouldn't invest in it. I wouldn't mess with it. You know, and the pitch will be something like typically like, yeah, this crypto, we're, we're, we're issuing this shit crypto that's worth absolutely nothing. But, you know, it, it's, we're going to sell it for um, a thousandth of a penny. And if the price goes up to a penny, then your one thousand dollar investment turns into you know a hundred thousand or five hundred thousand, right? And that's very appealing, right? Like like that I can put down a thousand bucks and have it instantly turn into five hundred thousand or three hundred thousand or whatever. And the problem with that is, obviously, first of all, it's bullshit most of the time. It's not going to happen. Uh, but then also, it's um, it's like at some point somebody's going to get hurt. Because remember, you're selling nothing. Like you're literally selling, you're not even selling um, networking effects. You're not even selling, the only network that exists is the, the network of people that all buy into the same BS, right? That's all you have. You don't have something like Bitcoin where you've got this network of invested people that are developing apps and really getting in there and processing transactions and doing things in a certain way, or Ethereum, where they're building apps on top of the Ethereum network that's creating this whole ecosystem of possibilities and that expand into the metaverse and all that stuff. You're just buying like something that somebody made up, you know, <laughs> and and, uh, and, that, and that's just a tough strategy, right? So uh, I'm not going to tell you NFTs. I I'm not, I wouldn't invest in NFTs, uh, Cloud Vision. I I, I I'm 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 curious about the NFT market. I think it's real. I think it's very real for artists because artistic authenticity has always had economic value, right? If, if I can prove that my painting is the original painting, which NFT, uh, you know, Ethereum blockchain technology allows you to do that to prove authenticity, um, that's valuable. That's always been valuable in art. And now, mind you, I'm not the guy who. Um, always believed in that. I always thought it's kind of silly. Like if you show me a painting that's just like the Mona Lisa, I'm gonna put it on my wall, and it, I, I don't feel like I have to have the actual Mona Lisa, right? That's something that's like a luxury super rich people, I guess, can afford. Um, and even though I have some money, I, I still wouldn't care enough to be like, oh, I'm gonna go spend ten million dollars so I can have the original Mona Lisa. I don't want, I don't want a fake, whatever, you know. Um, and so, in fact, I, I saw the Mona Lisa at the Louvre and there was it's, it was crazy because everybody, all these people were taking pictures of the Mona Lisa because it was the most famous painting. Right across in the same aisle was another painting that was done 600 years ago that was 10 times better, 10 times more amazing. And, and, and it was like, wow, like this great painting can't even get the same attention because the Mona Lisa has brand recognition. And so... Um, I would say with NFTs, I think for artists, uh, it's great, especially if you're selling NFTs. Um, I think that also the NFT market is uh, driven by a lot of money laundering. Uh, that's what dope dealers do. You know, when you get big money, you got to find some way to pump your money out. The hip hop music industry was pretty much a money laundering operation. A lot of it was that, you know, the dope dealers had all the money. So that's why they started backing all these artists that were rapping about how great it was to be a drug dealer, how great it is to get shot in the head and sent to prison for life. So you can get some some guy can, you know, rape you every night, like, right, whatever, you know, like, like they really glorified all that. So now you got like a whole generation of kids that think being a dope dealer is glamorous and cool. And uh, and so uh, so the same way hip same way the illegal money funded a lot of uh, hip hop music and it was a money laundering kind of thing. Um, and it's still going on to this day. Like when you see a lot of rappers getting killed, it's because a lot of rappers are coming from the life, you know, where they're laundering money by creating a record label. Like that's a great way to, you know, clean up your cash. And um, and then also with NFTs, uh, there are people that speculate the money laundering is behind the insane valuations of NFTs. And then in addition to that. Um, I think the re the record the record labels are 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 gaming the public. I think that uh, like recently when you saw Snoop Dogg, somebody paid one point two million dollars allegedly to to live next door to Snoop Dogg's digital mansion. Right, it's not a real place; it's just a an, a concept. And uh, and I, I I said that's BS. I called BS on that. I said so somebody got together with Snoop and said um, we want your brand to kind of hype up 
what we're doing. So everybody's going to pay attention because Snoop Dogg's involved. We're going to give you this free digital mansion. You just come in, do a shizzle dizzle every now and then, maybe rap, you know, rap a song. He ain't been a good rapper since the 90s. I mean, Snoop is not a good rapper. He, but for some reason, he's become this cultural icon, which, you know, good for him. Um, and so Snoop uh, lives in your little digital town. So everybody wants to be a part of it because everybody thinks it's cool, which, which, is, which to some extent is real value. But then what happens is, next thing you know, uh, there, there's uh, an eye popping number that comes out. Somebody paid 1.2 million to live next door to Snoop Dogg. Well, who paid that money? Oh, well, we, we can't tell you. Well, the reason you probably can't tell us is because the person who paid the money could be somebody who's in on the damn deal, right? Like you can create value. One of the loopholes of, of market valuation is that th there's a belief that an asset's value is equal to whatever someone out there is willing to pay for it. But that's a problem because if I want my wife's um, shoes to be uh, become a million dollar asset, you know what I could do? I could go to my wife and say, hey, babe, I'm going to write a check to you for a million dollars um, for your shoes. And then we're going to issue a press release to say that, you know, Dr. Alicia's shoes sell for a million dollars. And then you just give me the money right back. Right. Or it's going into our account anyway. So who cares? Right. But now I've got these quote unquote million dollar shoes which might make somebody else say, Ooh, Dr. Alicia's shoes are worth a million dollars. Well, and, and then, and then I go out and I say, Oh, but you know what, but you can get them now for a hundred thousand. Right. And people are like, Oh my God, I'm saving $900,000. No, you didn't. You didn't. You, you got kind of tricked. So ultimately I think that the digital real estate right now, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. A lot of my, my crypto experts think it's a big head fake. Um, I, I keep talking to more and more of them to try to get more of an assessment. I, I listen to a lot of different people and I haven't met a single crypto expert who feels good about, you know, this idea of spending insane amounts of money on on NF, uh, ugly NFTs and digital real estate. Doesn't mean it's not real. It's just, you know, it's something that still is yet to be discovered. Uh, what do you think about Tilray? Um, I think Tilray is fine. I mean, I think cannabis as an industry is what you want to look at, not so much individual stocks. So I, I'm not, I, I don't really know if Tilray is going to be the winner. It's, it's like if you go back, remember with the internet, everybody knew the internet was going to be big. Like if you go back to '95, everybody knew the internet was going to be the big thing, right? Just like now, everybody talks about the metaverse being the big thing. Well, in '95, everybody knew the internet was going to take over the game. They just didn't know what that looked like. Right. So same thing is true now. You know, the metaverse is going to be big. You just don't know exactly what it's going to look like. You don't know which companies are going to be the leaders. In 95, no one ever could have guessed. Google didn't even exist in 95. Facebook did not exist in 95. I heard about Facebook for the first time when my students were all on Facebook in 19 and sorry, 2006, 2005, 2006. I was like, what is this Facebook thing? And they're like, oh, it's something where college students all connect and talk, whatever. Then suddenly in 2009, they started saying, okay, let's let, let in the old people. Let's let in everybody else. So the next thing you know, everybody had a Facebook account. But, you know, again, you go back to when the internet was kind of taken off. Facebook didn't exist. Google didn't exist. Half the damn biggest companies on the internet didn't exist. Amazon was like, like a, an ant at that time, right? So, so you know, again, long-term investing, if you had just, if you saw the potential of Amazon and bought a bunch of it and just bought it consistently, literally the same amount of money that people might have wasted on fast food and Air Jordans and whatever else people buy, literally you would be, you could be a millionaire very easily off of that, right? Easily, right? Or if you invested in a basket of internet stocks, just, or, or in some mutual fund, that, you know, that said, look, we're going to find the best companies on the internet and place our money there. If you did that, but you know, then, then you would you would have tons of money, right? But what you it, what would probably lose cause you to lose your money is if you said, "I'm gonna bet on AOL. I think AOL is gonna dominate the future in this internet thing." And you start putting all your money into AOL. Well, you'd get your ass kicked because AOL, ain't, you know, it's, it's not. They're not. I don't even. I don't know what AOL does anymore. Like somebody said, I still have my AOL account and MySpace. Remember MySpace? Oh God, it became my spam. It was ugly. Uh, and in fact, actually, I've been. I happened to meet um, the founder of MySpace when I went to. Uh, I had a meeting in California, and I asked him. I said, "So what happened to MySpace?" And he said, "He said that Fox. I don't know if it was the Fox Network or whatever. They bought it." And when they bought it, he said they totally messed it up because they didn't know how to run it. So that's that's the story I got. We only talked for about two minutes, so I don't know anything else. Um, but by the way, so anyway, guys, I'm gonna get on out of here. Um, if you um, 
If you want to join us Friday, we're doing a Forex event for free in the Black Business School. If you're interested in learning Forex, uh, our Forex instructor is Courtney Logan. He's an attorney and a Forex expert. Uh, if you want to join us, uh, uh, just go to BoyceWatkins.com. And at the top, you can hit the link and you can join the event for free. It's going to be on Friday. Uh, and um, and that's pretty much it. So um, if you're on Instagram, the link is in the bio. So have a good day, everybody. Uh, hit the thumbs up button on your way out if you're watching on YouTube. And I will see you guys soon. Happy investing. I hope you make a ton of money. And I love you. Oh, book club. Yeah, tonight the book club happens also. So if you want to join us for the Dr. Boyce book club, uh, you can join live for free. Uh, oh, what time? Friday It's going to be 8 o'clock Friday. And the book club is tonight at 8.30 Eastern. So here is the um, book we're reading. We are Black Labor, White Wealth by Dr. Claude Anderson. We are on page 162. And so we're almost done with this book. And we're doing, uh, I've done probably about 20 lectures out of this book so far. And I'm going to continue to break it down for you so you can understand this because you must understand these sorts of things if you're black. Uh, it, it really, white people should learn it too, but I'm not here to educate white people. If you're white, no disrespect to you, but I don't. You, you, I'm sure you're taking care of your people. I'm, I'm taking care of mine. So um, I believe every black person in America needs to learn stuff like this. Um, half the stuff we learn in school is garbage anyway. We need to learn the right stuff. We need to get the right education. Black people need to be educated on uh, wealth and financial security so that people aren't slapping you around and disrespecting you and controlling your life. Uh, we need to learn how to rebuild our families. Every man, every woman should be trained on how to run a family, how to run a household so that your kids aren't running right here, you know, getting hit with baby mama itis, baby daddy itis, child support, you know, all these things that drain black wealth and destroy your children and you have your kids out in the street. Your daughter's out here selling, selling, selling cookies on the corner, if you know what I mean. Your son's out here trying to slang dope because he want to be a dope boy now because he never had a daddy. Like, kill all that, man. Seriously. You, we, so we need to, what else do we need? To, we need to learn our history. Because if you know how great you are, you wouldn't you would you would stop chasing around other people trying to get down with them. Why you yes, you know, think about this. You are extraordinary people. Why are you wasting your time chasing behind mediocre ass sons of bitches? Like sis, why are you you're chasing around mediocre people trying to get approval from mediocre people because you don't realize how extraordinary you are? That's because a lot of a lot of us never learn our history. We learn white history. We learn how extraordinary they are. We never learn how extraordinary we are. Uh so so I personally think, oh, and then other little things like health. Like I think every Black person, when they're a kid, should be trained just on general health, physical and mental health. If you're mentally healthy, what happens is that when you have your mental health in check, you're able to get past your own BS to form healthy relationships and to achieve your goals. Most people, you have no idea how many talented people I see who can't get past like first base in their life because they got some hang up from childhood that they never worked through. Well, guess what? There's an army of thousands of therapists that can really help you. But for some reason, we decided therapy is bad. But we think Molly's good and 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 gangbanging is cool and being a dope deal is cool. But we we think therapy. Oh, I ain't gonna go see no therapist. I, why? I don't get it. Because <laughs> that will open you up and free you to be able to accomplish your goals so that you're not getting in your own way, right? So uh, physical health, what are we eating? What are you putting in your body? You know, they're, they're po they're, they start killing you from birth. The, 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 the food industry is incredibly corrupt. They feed you poison on a regular basis. <clears throat> they're doing absolutely everything in their, in their power to kill you in every way imaginable. And you don't even know where, what's going on with all that. So I think all these things, like this needs to be part of the basic black curriculum. <clears throat> and so when I'm working with people like Brother Ben X, who's doing uh, Hereafter Farms, I told him I'd be an investor. I said, I want to own a plot, like all of that, right? I just think it's a great concept. Uh, and now, and then when I talk to Ben, I'm going to say, okay, how are we going to educate our kids in the right way? Um, because I'm telling you, the Nation of Islam knows how to educate black people. If I went to visit Muhammad University of Islam in Chicago twice. Those kids are like 12 and they were asking me questions that graduate students ask me. I have taught MBA students at Syracuse University. I've taught people in graduate school. These 12 year olds were right there with the grad students. But if I go to Chicago public school, everybody's distracted, you know, look on, on the iPhone, you know, like try to get Gucci, try to get a new pair of Jordans, like broken English, can't, can't even put a sentence together, can't, can't even, you know, I'm not making fun of anybody. I promise you I'm not. I'm just really highlighting how deliberately and how intentionally they work to make sure you stay as dumb as possible. That you not only stay dumb, but you literally encourage other people to be dumb and literally embrace stupidity on every level. And uh, and and I, I and I'll tell you one thing that made me really sad was I was talking to um, 
a, a young lady who um, was in her like like 29, 20, 29 years old. She went to an inferior kind of school and she's into hair. She's really good with hair. And I was explaining to her how people make so much money with the hair business and and how running a hair shop can really, you know, accelerate your money. Right. And she was all for it. Smart lady, everything else. So I said, OK, so I, I think I said something like um, I said, so let's say that you have um, a hair shop and you have 10 people doing hair for you and uh, and they bring in, you know, let's say in a given week, they bring in ten thousand dollars. And let's say you do a 50 50 split with them. You get half. They get half. So I said, so if ten thousand dollars comes in and you get half of that. How much is how much money did you bank that week? She could not answer the question. She could not even tell me what it means to get half the money. And if you get 10000 and you get half and they get half, how much is your half? She couldn't answer the question. She froze. She just got quiet. And I, and, and I, and I was blown away because it really, and, and again, this was just one story, but I've seen others like this. It really alarmed me because it made me reflect on how strategically they've worked to ensure that black people are as ignorant as we can possibly be. There are really young people out here like this. Like, I'm not kidding. This ain't, this ain't rare. This ain't rare. I mean, don't get me wrong. And I, I mean, sure there's brilliance out here as well, but if you, have you ever watched like, you know, like a couple, a couple young, like 19 year olds, like, they really didn't get a good education, like how they might tweet back and forth with each other. Like, I don't know what's going on. Da, 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 da. Like they they sound out all their words, you know, and I'm not making I'm not making fun of it. Right. Or saying that it's always bad. I mean, there's a counterculture that comes with it, with every youth movement and all that. And, I, and we were all we all had kind of our, you know, our way of doing things different. But it's it's disturbing. It's like disturbing because. They like I know in I know in our generation, like we kind of learned like that you turn whatever you're doing, if you're doing broken English or whatever, you turn that off if you're trying to like go, you know, compete in the economic system. Whether you're looking for a job or starting a business or whatever, you you conduct yourself differently than you do when you're with your homeboys or your friends. I don't know if a lot of our young people ever get that. And I'm gonna tell you the, the reason they're not getting it is because they're that you literally have your kids being educated. By people who not only care nothing about them, but don't respect them, who literally want to do harm to you in your community, who want to, you know, and that's oppression, right? That's what the basis of oppression was during slavery. That's why they worked so hard to make sure the slaves couldn't read. Well, you know, hundreds of years later, they still make sure the slaves can't read. Uh, and, and then what happens is that the less informed you are um, and the less confident you are, the more you're willing to go along with whatever they tell you to do. What, you know, they just like with the pandemic, they, you know, they, they didn't want you thinking about it. They didn't want you digging for your own information. They didn't want you coming to your own conclusions. They wanted you frozen and, and, and ignorant and basically taking orders from Dr. Fauci without questioning anything. Right. So just be careful with that because that's what they're doing to your kids. So a job one for black people, in my opinion, is in this generation. We must completely take over the educational system. We must completely use technology and all the resources that are out here. There's so many damn resources. I mean, you can get on the internet and educate any child you want on the internet, just on internet resources. They got MIT classes on, on, on YouTube, right? There's so much stuff out here. Uh, and, and that's what, that's what led me to leave Syracuse. I left Syracuse university and I said, I got the internet. I, I think I can build, I can build an audience and just educate people the right way. You know, without have, having to ask these people's permission, I don't even need these, you know, these administrators to give me permission to talk to people. Like I can do this myself. I just have to make an investment and make it and build the infrastructure, right? So we have to have a mindset of builders. You know, uh, these athletes that are complaining about, you know, what the NFL does and all that. Stop complaining. Start a damn league. Like you know, the Chicago Bears will purchase for a hundred dollars. They're worth about three billion dollars right now. What are you doing? Like, why? Are, what is? What's stopping you? What's stop? Well, what's stopping you is what's up here, right? They they don't just um, dif they don't just keep you ignorant. They kind of create a ceiling of possibility for you, right? Where you can't imagine yourself actually feeding yourself. Like you're a grown ass man, right? And think about this. Think about how deformed this is. I, we've all been in this where you're a grown ass man, but you really believe you can't feed yourself without a white man doing it for you, like. 
so that's if that's not white supremacy, I don't know what is. And and it's not his white supremacy that's holding you back. It's your white supremacy. It's the fact that you believe that you can't do anything on your own without getting his permission. So you're going to go out and you're going to complain about how the NFL won't give you a job and, and the NBA won't let you own a team and all this other stuff. And you don't even understand. You don't even look back and realize, wait a minute, I have $80 million in the bank and I've got 20 friends who've got $80 million in the bank. And we all know how to play basketball. And we all know how we all have you know, a collective social media following of half a billion people. We could probably develop our own league right now. And it, it, what's stopping you? Well, it's, it's a lack of imagination. It's a lack of courage, you know, and that's kind of what it is. So we need to have um, if I if I had a choice between being a smart person who thinks small or a, you know, somewhat dumb person who thinks big. I'd rather be the dumb person who thinks big. What stops people is not skill and imagination or skill, me, skill and, and, and understanding of the, of the technical aspect of doing something. What usually stops people is just that they just can't, they just think tiny, you know? And, 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 um, and I learned that, I remember noticing that when I got my PhD, I said, my God, we got so many people that are so brilliant that are learning all these cutting edge theories, but they'll never make an impact on the world because they're literally, it's like a pinprick. They're literally drilling into this tiny little niche and doing this tiny little work that no one will ever see. But they're doing tiny things at an amazing level. And, and I said, no, I don't want to do tiny things. I want to do big things. Even if I do them wrong, uh, I want to do big things. Like Even if I don't succeed in doing exactly what I plan to do, you're, the world is not going to not know that I was here. Right? That's not going to happen. That was something I decided 20 years ago. And, um, and so far, so good. Right? Uh, but sometimes you do things wrong, right? But sometimes just having the audacity to try again is literally the difference between um, the person who gets there and the person who doesn't get there. So a little bit of audacity is is something that you probably need, but audacity requires you to love yourself enough to forgive yourself when you do fuck up. You know, if you make a mistake, so what? You keep going. You try again. Try again, right? I I, I mean, believe me, I, I my God, I have made mistakes. I have been uh, attacked relentlessly called a simp because when I met, when I fell in love with my wife, I have had I mean, a million people, like I, like a million people attacked me at one time. And it's like, fuck all y'all. Like I, I love boys. Like I'm riding with him to the wheels fall off and you ain't stopping that. You can't turn that off. Right. And so I encourage everybody, like, just love yourself. It starts with love. Everything starts with love. Love is the most powerful force in the universe. You build off love. Once you start with love, love for self, love for community, love for your purpose, love for your people, love for the things that matter to you, then you can build all everything else off of that. But if you don't love yourself, then everything else falls apart. So start with love. So love is our word for today. I know we started off talking about the stock market, but y'all know how I am. I just stream of consciousness. That's what it is. I hope it benefits you. So um, anyway, I'm going to go. Let's see. Give me Plur. Thank you for your donation. She says, when will you make old, old book club recordings available? I can't always make it because I work, but I really need the information. Okay, here's what you can do. If you go to the thedrboycebookclub.com, thedrboycebookclub.com, Every single book club meeting is there. Every single lecture I did is there. There's about 20 of them there now. By the time I'm done, there's going to be over 100, right? Because every week we just do this. And I'm going to do this until I get through Black Labor, White Wealth, Powernomics, um, Dirty Little Secrets by Dr. Claude Anderson. I think he has, wait, is this the part two? No, this is just part one. Um, and also the Black History Reader. We're going to cover that. And here's the other one. The other one is More Dirty Little Secrets. So these are the books right here. And, and actually, Dr. Anderson, if you go to powernomics.com, he has a whole library pack where you can get all these books. And uh, I'm literally going to go through every single one of these books. And so right now I've gone through uh, most of this first one. But and these other ones are going to follow after that. So that, that's what the plan is. And it's going to happen. So we'll probably finish most of that in 2022 and 2023. So can't stop, won't stop. So God bless you guys. I'm out of here. Have a good day. Again, if you want to join us for the Forex event, just go to voicewalkers.com. The link is at the top. Or if you're watching um, on Instagram, the link is in the bio. Uh, I'll see you guys soon. Take care. Have a good day. I hope you make a trillion dollars. Love you. See you soon. Peace.